section. Let's talk about first what a crisis is. I've taught you this before. I look up the definition of words. Now the thing is, is that we all think we know what something means. And then you look up the definition and it's like, oh, that's actually a little different than what I thought. And this was the case with crisis. I actually, it was a little different. I mean, well, you know, if I, if I asked all of you what crisis means, I'd probably get at least five different answers. Because we think we know what it means. But a crisis is actually, listen, it's actually a turning point. I never knew that. It's a turning point, for better or worse, in an acute disease or fever, uh, an attack of pain or distress, a disordered function, an emotionally significant event, or a radical change of status in a person, a city, a situation, a nation. So it's actually a turning point. The crisis point, even in literature, because I'm a writer, I mean, I'm a writer. Uh, in literature, they call the crisis point, that point of inflection, right before the denouement, which is the part where the resolution comes. And so that is the crisis. That is the moment where the main character in the story has an opportunity. Will I make the right moral choice? You watch movies. You see this in every movie. Will I stay married? Will I get married? Will I take the job? Will I confess the crime? Whatever it is, it's that crisis point. It's the turning point. It's the point where everything comes to a head and a decision has to be made. A crisis is also an unstable or crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending. In 2008, when we had the financial crisis in the States, I remember there were so many pundits trying to determine what will we do about it? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And we actually had all the former presidents with the current president in agreement about what to do. They stood together. I wish we'd see elders in the body of Christ stand together in times like that of crisis when attacks are coming. You know, I was speaking with a man of God today about a situation and he's like, when are the elders and the prophetic going to get together and stand together and stop listening to the attacks and the accusations of these young guns who just want a platform. I said, sir, I do, not, I do not know. I said, but I will stand with you today. Amen. Somebody's got to do the hashtag we stand together. I'm always doing hashtag we stand together and I'm grateful for all the men and women of God who stand with me and I stand. For. Listen, if I say I've got your back, I've got it for real. And the crisis is when you find out who is really with you and who has held the hand of the accuser, the brethren. Who is holding the hand of the one that is slandering you? Because when we come into agreement with the accuser, the brethren, through actions, through deeds, through words, through prayers, just through unconscious effort, we are actually complicit in the crime of the accuser. Isn't that amazing? What you align with, you're agreeing with. What you agree with, you're empowering. And so in times of crisis, you really find out who is with you, who your fair weather friends are. Amen. You know, somebody once said, you know, somebody, uh, I can't remember how my grandfather put it. I'm going to butcher it. Maybe I better not try. Yeah, I better not try. Maybe it'll come to me the way he put it. But there are crises in the world. So my definition of crisis intercession is standing in the gap during turning points states of affairs, impending changes, emotionally significant events, and unstable times. Standing in the gap when it really matters. Standing in the gap. It's always important to pray. And not everyone is called to be a crisis intercessor. I do believe that we will all have the opportunity to stand in that anointing or wear that mantle because we all face crises. But there are some who are actually literally called to be crisis intercessors. And the, I'm telling you, that's one of the most hardcore things. It's like uh, the crisis intercessors have been compared to paramedics, the prayer paramedics. Because they're there, they're doing triage, they're assessing, what do I pray for first? What do I pray for next? What do I pray for last? Well, how do I pray? So, Father, I thank you for the anointing of the Spirit of God tonight. Help us, Lord, to see, to hear, to understand to know how to stand in this realm when you call us there, whether it's all the time or whether it's on occasion. Help us, Lord, to appreciate the crisis intercessor. Help us, Lord, to understand the challenges, the pitfalls, the role, the responsibility. And help us, Lord, to be willing in the day of your power to step into this mantle, 
if it so be thy will, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, C. Peter Wagner, who's gone on to be with the Lord, he said it like this. He said, a crisis intercessor prays almost exclusively on assignment, and the assignment comes from the Father. So this is not something that you just decide to step into. You're drawn into it by the Holy Ghost. Any, listen, anything we do, we need to be drawn into it by the Holy Ghost, or it will not be fruitful. We will wear ourselves out in our flesh if we do things by the flesh. We've got to be led by everything. Someone say, I've got to be led. We've really got to be led. We get ourselves into so many problems and situations, even crises, because we're not led. We're led by our emotions or we're led by the enemy sometimes, deception. We're led by sometimes anything other than the Spirit of God, and then we wonder why something didn't turn out. With crisis intercession, this is not for the faint of heart. You know, not everybody's an EMT. Talk to EMTs. Talk to paramedics. Man, they deal with some stuff. If you're not willing to deal with the stuff, don't step into it. If you're not led, you won't be able to handle it. It's hardcore. This is the hardcore stuff right here.